to see everybody out. Good to see every one of you. So thankful that you're here tonight. I uh, want to take this time just to shamelessly plug something that we've got coming up very soon, and that's Child Haven. We'll be going to Child Haven here in just a few short weeks. And uh, it's open to all those who are sixth grade through college age. So I hope that you are planning on going. If you fit into that bracket or if you have children in that bracket, I hope that you are encouraging them to go. We are going to be doing some work there around the campus to help, uh, to help out with things around the campus. The Child Haven is a children's home, in case you didn't already know that. It's a children's home down there in Coleman, Alabama. And we'll be doing some things around that campus and then also we will be uh, playing some games and doing some different things with Child Haven to, to lift their spirits and to encourage them in their walk. So I hope that you will be planning on joining us, joining us for that. It's always good to be home. I've been out of town for a couple of weeks and it's always, it's a good feeling when you get back home. Uh, but home isn't necessarily a little place out in Whitehead, even though we got some pretty good neighbors out there. Uh, Home is where your family is, right? That's what everyone thinks about when you think about home. That's where Amanda and Ella and Owen are for me, and it's where your family is for you. That's home. That's where you want to be. That's, that's home. Uh, while I was there in California, I had an opportunity to attend church at the Park Avenue Church of Christ, and, and there it's, it's different because there were 30 people there for Sunday morning worship, and so our youth group, you know, in class on Wednesday nights, is uh, is larger than that so that's it's different it, it makes you appreciate what we have here when in a town of 200,000 plus there are four small churches that barely add up to 100 people and so if you think about being in the sea of that and you only have 100 other people that have a similar faith to yours and what that would do for you and, and so it's it encourages me to see them being faithful but it also lets me know how much I, I should appreciate what we have here, what we have here in, in almost, or, or over 10 times that number. Tonight, what I want to talk to you about is I'm going to have three questions for you that I'd like for you to think about this week. The first question is, what are you doing? The second question is, why are you doing what you're doing? And the third question is, are we acting with urgency? If you will turn with me to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. We'll start out here in verse 1. This is a story that we're, that we're all very familiar with. In verse 1, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen he who was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. And he said, I am he. If you'll humor me for a moment, think about someone that you see almost every day. Maybe it's someone at work. Maybe it's someone that you don't have a lot of interaction with, but you say hi on the way into work. Maybe it's someone at the front desk or something like that. You know that person. You know that person's name, and you know what that person looks like, and you're going to recognize him. This man sat there at the temple every day. He'd been blind since birth, and he was there all the time. These people knew who he was, but yet once he had received sight, they didn't recognize him anymore. They didn't recognize him anymore. So he who had been physically blind was not recognized by those who had sight from the beginning. Here we see that Jesus was moved. He moved and he went into action. We see in verse 4, I must work the works of he who sent me while it is day. We know a part of that mission that God had given him was to seek and save the lost. We see that in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, that Jesus was sent 
to seek and to save the lost. We'll talk about that a, few, a little bit more in a few minutes. Here in verse 5, we see that Jesus says that as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. We know that sometime after this, Jesus died, and he was buried, and he was resurrected on the third day. And we also see in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, if you'll turn with me there, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus is expecting us to be the light of the world. Jesus is expecting us to be the light of the world. The other person who moved here was the blind man. The blind man had to move. He had to get up. He had to go to the pool of Siloam and wash. You think about that for a blind man, that might have been challenging. He probably had to get someone to guide him, or at least someone to help him along the way. We don't know how far he had to travel or how far exactly he was to that pool, but he had to get up and move. I think you would agree with me that the healing power was not in the dirt, it was not in the spit, it was not in the clay, it was not in the water there in the pool, but it was in his obedience. In the fact that he acted on Christ's words. He took those words to heart and he did those things. He did those things. So if we think about Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, how we're called to be a light. Think about for just a few minutes, am I a light? Am I a light to the world? Am I a light to those around me? Those that I interact with on a daily basis, am I a light? And am I doing good works to glorify my Father? Next question tonight is, why are you doing what you're doing? You'll understand this a little bit more in just a moment. But if someone were to come up to you and ask you, what's the best part of your religion? Let's say it's someone that uh, is familiar with God and, and is interested in learning more about God, but they don't really know much about God or much about the Bible, and they ask you, What's the best part of your religion? What would your answer be? Chew on that for just a minute while, we're, while we continue on. I heard a lesson by David Shannon uh, a few months ago, and it was on this topic of the Sunday assembly, and it, 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 it caused me to think about, just at the core of my being, who am I? What, what am I doing, and why am I doing what I'm doing? So I want to share this with you tonight, and and hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll have the same, same thoughts. Now, the Sunday Assembly is a group of atheists. So if I told you that a group of atheists decided to form a church, you'd think I was crazy, but they did. A group of atheists uh, formed by two comedians, oddly enough, Sanderson and Pippa, in England, decided to form a church, a godless church. Their purpose is to celebrate life, to build communities, to live better, to help often, and wonder more. And what they mean by wondering more is to listen to talks, listen to readings, different philosophies, etc., and, and to sing as one. Any of this sound familiar yet? They have taken what they refer to as the best parts of the church, but left God out. They believe in good, but not God. That kind of blew me away when I first heard about that. You know, if I were to tell you that there was a Sunday assembly in Los Angeles, you wouldn't be that surprised, and I wouldn't either. You'll pass by all kinds of crazy things. You'll see the Church of Scientology and all other kinds of bizarre things there. So it wouldn't really surprise you that much. But what if I told you that there was a Sunday assembly in Nashville, Tennessee? It's a little bit closer to home. A little bit closer to home. You remember our earlier question. What do you think is the best part of your religion? Your answer might have been, well, I just love doing good for other people. I just love the fellowship. I love getting and coming here and, and spending time with these other Christians. I love the fellowship. Or maybe, I love to come and hear an inspirational message or, or to sing songs. I love to come and sing. But here's the problem, friends. If our relationship with God and the gift of Christ who washed away our sins is not the number one reason and the best part of our religion, then we've got a problem. 
We've got a problem. If I can take what I'm doing here at the Rogersville Church of Christ and I can travel up to Nashville, Tennessee and go to the Sunday Assembly Church and not change anything I'm doing and not change the reason that I do it, then I've got a problem. I've got a problem. It doesn't matter if it's a work as a, as a deacon, work with the youth, work in whatever area it is that you find yourself working in. Maybe it's making food and, and taking food to some of our members here who are sick or not able to, to take care of themselves. Maybe it's going and visiting. But whatever work that is, if we can take God out of that work and still continue to do that work, then what good is it really doing us? What good is it really doing us? So I've got some questions for you. Do we only gather to celebrate values, to do good for others? What is at the core of who I am? Why do I do good to others? Do I do good for other people because it makes me feel good? Or do I do good for other people because it's what God has asked me to do? Do I believe in God or good? Do I have faith? And if I have faith, in what or in whom? Is my relationship with God and Christ really at the top of my list? Or is it just somewhere on the page? Who am I, and is Christ really my king? We sing a song sometimes in here, but oftentimes in our youth devotionals and uh, when we have the PowerPoint in here, sometimes we'll sing it in here, but it's called Lord Reign in Me. I'd like for you to, to listen to the lyrics for just a moment. Over all the earth you reign on high, every sun, mountain stream, every sunset sky. But by one request, Lord, my only aim is that you'd reign in me again. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams and my darkest hour. You are the Lord of all I am, so won't you reign in me again? Over every thought, over every word, may my life reflect the beauty of my Lord. Because you mean more to me than any earthly thing, so won't you reign in me again? That song has a lot different meaning to me now than it did before. Is Christ really the king of my life? In Colossians, if you want to go ahead and turn, be turned into Colossians chapter 1, Mike already read for us in a vivid description of our King, of Christ. We're going to read a few verses before that. We're not going to repeat what he just read, but we're going to read verses 9 through 14 in Colossians chapter 1. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power. For all patience and long suffering and joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness, and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Friends, kingdom living is different than living in the world. Our behavior, our purpose, our expectations, our hope should be different when Christ is the king of our life, when he is living in us. Our lives should be completely different if we left out the king. Everything that we do should be for him. So I'll ask again, why are you doing what you're doing? Back in John chapter 9. Back in John chapter 9. So we see this account of Jesus and the blind man, the man who was born blind. And we see that Jesus, from his response to the apostles' questions, that he did not delay. He received a mission from God, and he didn't delay in it. 
He took it up. He didn't put it off. He didn't wait till tomorrow, wait for another day. He started it. And he moved. We also see from this conversation that there will be a time when it's going to be too late. There was obviously urgency in Jesus' mission. So my question for us tonight is, is there urgency in our life? Is there an urgency to seek and to save the lost? Or have we lost that? Have we gotten too comfortable? It's easy to do. I feel like that I have in my life sometimes lost that urgency to to teach others, to, to try to bring them into Christ. And I don't know if it's because maybe we think that we've got more time. Maybe it's convenient to put things off until tomorrow. I'm not sure what the real reason is, but I'm asking you tonight to evaluate yourself and, and see, is there an urgency there? Is there an urgency to seek and to save the lost? Oftentimes, we wait, it seems like anyways, we may wait for the unsaved to come to us. It's almost like we, we gather here and we worship God and we expect people to just come in the door. But it doesn't work that way, does it? They're not going to come in here unless we're out there. Think about the amount of time that you spend in this building and think about the time that you spend preparing to be in this building, whether it's preparing to teach a class or maybe it's just your own personal study. But think about that amount of time that you spend for that and compare that to the amount of time that, that we spend seeking the lost. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be here on Sunday and Wednesday nights. We definitely should. This is where God wants us to be. He wants us to gather together to praise and glorify his name. But what I am saying is that sometimes we put other things in our life at a higher priority than the lost. You think about the, the blind man. The only way that he was going to be saved was if he moved and if he obeyed. We're no different today. We're no different than that blind man today. Christ has given us instruction. He has guided our life. We have the words of Christ and the words of the apostles and the words to guide our life. And it's our choice whether or not we're going to get up and move. It's up to us. It's up to us.